Hello, welcome to today's Healthline webinar from the American Association of Kidney Patients titled Home Dialysis, Key Learnings from COVID-19 and Beyond, made possible by an educational donation from Baxter. My name is Erin Kale, and I am AAKP's Director of Patient Insights, Data Analytics, and Advocacy. I oversee our patient research and education activities, as well as our grass grassroots engagement activities that fall under our Center for Patient Engagement and Activity and Advocacy. This includes our ambassador initiative, which comprises highly motivated and engaged patients, caregivers, and living kidney donors around the country and the globe. We will hear from a few of our ambassadors a little later on in today's presentation. AAKP's Healthline webinars fall under our Center for Patient Research and Education. We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives. And we work to ensure that the patient has a central role in research and guidance that are designed to determine optimal approaches and strategies for providing healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. This is especially true during national emergencies such as the coronavirus pandemic. We built this center with the latest polling and engagement technologies to ensure that kidney patients take a central role in informing the federal, academic, and private sector research, shaping the next generation of healthcare services, assistance programs, and innovative new treatments. And we encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities. Thank you all for joining us today for another Healthline webinar in our COVID webinar series. At this time, I'd like to introduce Paul Conway, AAKP's Chair of Policy and Global Affairs. Paul was previously on peritoneal dialysis, and he is now celebrating 25 years with his kidney transplant. Paul, I turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Aaron. 25 years, it's a long time. But actually, one of the reasons why I think I was able to get a transplant and stay healthy during the process of getting it is because my doctors recommended to me to do home care and specifically peritoneal dialysis. I was able to keep working. I didn't become overly dependent. And through a good network of uh, friends and family, I was able to uh, stay healthy and do it at my convenience, my care. Uh, today's session is going to be terrific for you. We have Dr. Janice Lee and two of our really terrific ambassadors, Mihi and Melissa, who you'll see later. COVID is a devastating illness, and you folks know it quite well. We've worked really hard for the past several years to stay safe. Yet this week, it was announced that the United States hit an important milestone, 1 million deaths. 1 million of our fellow citizens around the country have been impacted and died from this disease, and think of their families. For us, the COVID pandemic is not over. We continue to exercise caution, and we've seen some interesting insights come out of where we are in the COVID pandemic, and one of those is in home dialysis. AAKP has been a longtime champion of patient care choice. And what does that mean? It means that we believe that patients should have the choice of care options that best suit their ability to fulfill the aspirations they have, which is to work full-time or part-time, own a home, start a family, retire securely, to pursue those dreams that you want to pursue, and then have the care tailored to work for you and not to have to live your life around your care option. And that's why we're very pleased today to present you with information on your options. Let's go ahead and take a look at this first slide. So we went out and we tried to find out what the impact of COVID was on the decision-making that folks had uh, for home dialysis and home therapies. And what you see here are a couple of highlights of that survey. 47% chose a home therapy because it was more convenient, 53% because it was safer to social distance with a home therapy versus in-center dialysis, and 42% because a doctor recommended it. So in summary, what does this really mean? It means that as devastating as COVID has been, it has accelerated the conversations around home dialysis options and the decisions that patients are making to stay safe and their families are supporting to make certain that patients stay safe. Let's take a look at the next slide. This is the impact of technology and how te COVID has accelerated telemedicine technologies. Three key highlights. In the first one, we see that 63% of transplant patients are using telehealth and telemedicine during the pandemic. And that makes complete sense. 
why put your life at risk to go into a hospital or an outpatient clinic center to have tests done or to have uh, consultations with your doctors when you can do it by telemedicine or you can arrange a telemedicine through the telemedicine, a lab visit at your home. 35% using telehealth telemedicine because of the pandemic among dialysis patients. This is also interesting because people are trying to limit their time in the dialysis center and their exposure to different infections beyond just COVID. And in the last point here, 39% started using telehealth and telemedicine for their patient appointments due to the pandemic. And this is healthcare professionals. So not only has uh, COVID and technology driven opportunities for patients, but just as importantly, they've driven opportunities for providers and for the medical community to kind of get with the program of where patients really are, which is we demand and expect flexibilities and rapid, rapid implementation of technologies so that we're safe and care is convenient to us. So what do we do with all this different information? Here's what we're doing right now and we're the, in the middle of with a lot of support from our ambassadors around the United States. We're developing discussion guides or, or conversation starters that patients can have with them and their families to start the conversation with their providers before they ever go on dialysis about what their options are and what does home care provide for the patient, not just in terms of medical care, in terms of extra filtration and all these different types of things and the flexibility of therapy, but all the other issues that come along with that, like caregiver burden. How do we reduce the number of trips? How do we keep people safer? Those types of things. And the other discussion guide that will be coming up in a conversation starter is how to make a transition. So if you're currently getting your care in center at a dialysis center, what kinds of questions do you need to ask your provider, your doctor, and your family members that would make it easier for you to transition off of care in center and take that care home uh, where it's easier for you to pursue your aspirations? So we appreciate your engagement today. We really look forward to listening closely to Dr. Lee and to Mihi and to Melissa and get some encouragement out there and understand that there is a lot of technology and a lot of flexibility through home dialysis. It's your choice. And organizations like AAQP, we respect your right to make your choice and we will back you up on anything that you need and give you the tools that you need so you can pick and choose the care that best aligns with your aspirations. So thank you very much for joining us today and we pass it over to my colleague, Aaron. Go ahead, Aaron. Thank you so much, Paul, and happy kidneyversary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to those of you who have shared your insights through this survey. We have a great webinar on Slate for today, so let's get started with our first speaker. Dr. Lee, Dr. Janice Lee, is a professor of medicine at Emory University, and she is board certified in nephrology and hypertension. She earned her medical degree at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston and completed her residency in internal medicine and a nephrology fellowship at Emory University affiliated hospitals. She also received a master's of science degree in clinical research from Emory's School of Public Health. Dr. Lee is currently a professor of medicine at Emory University and is the clinical director of nephrology and the chief medical director of Emory Dialysis, which serves over 750 patients. Dr. Lee is also the medical director for home dialysis at Emory Healthcare, which currently serves 130 home patients. Dr. Lee's research and clinical expertise are in hypertension, chronic kidney disease, health disparities, and dialysis. She is a nationally renowned expert in hypertension, designated a clinical specialist in hypertension by the American Society of Hypertension. Dr. Lee also designated is also, excuse me, is designated a master clinician by Emory's School of University and serves as the director of telenephrology at Emory since 2017. In addition, she serves on the board of directors for the American Association of Kidney Patients. And Dr. Lee has been named one of Atlanta's top doctors for the past 10 years and is recognized nationally for her expertise in clinical research and patient care. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Lee. I will turn things over to you. Thank you, Aaron. 
Um, it is a pleasure to be here to present on the effects of the COVID pandemic on home dialysis. So I am currently a professor of medicine at Emory University um, and again, an AAKP board member. And I am thrilled to be here to talk about home dialysis in the midst of the COVID pandemic. My objectives today are to review how COVID affected our dialysis population, this how telehealth and other technologies enables closer monitoring of patients on home dialysis, and then to discuss how we can increase utilization of home dialysis. Just why, by way of background, um, we certainly know that, that the minority populations, African-Americans, Hispanics, were disproportionately affected by COVID in really all aspects of, of the pandemic. And as far as dialysis patients, we know that they were almost seven times more likely to contract COVID, more likely to be hospitalized, and certainly a higher um, death rate uh, from COVID compared to the general population. We know that lack of access to health care uh, with patients with more comorbidities, such as ob obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and chronic kidney disease, as well as poverty, inability to social distance, the presence of more frontline job workers, all of this contributed to this disparity. Um, we know clearly that patients on home dialysis uh, were less likely to be exposed to the virus, and I'll show you some slides on that uh, coming up. And then we know that there's still a need for more efforts, um, including research needed in these higher risk groups to identify and attenuate the barriers that it, to adhere to mitigation strategies and to improve the um, outcome of this um, population. This is just a publication that I was involved with. Um, there is many publications about the racial disparities in COVID-19. We did um, um, some analyses on our patient population at Emory. And listed here is just showing you all of the comorbidities that were associated with higher risk of COVID. Um, and outlined as diabetes um, and chronic kidney disease, as, um, um, as well as lung disease, et cetera. And then we certainly know in patients who did not have kidney disease, there was still a lot of patients and, um, and disproportionately affected the African-American population with the incidence of acute kidney injury. Um, and you can see the, per the percentages here, really on average about 37% higher risk of an African-American to get acute kidney injury compared mm -hmm. to a non-African-American. And then this has implications down the line because we're gonna have a, a, a larger population of patients with chronic kidney disease who eventually uh, may go on to dialysis. So this has not just impacted our current CKD population, but the future as well. Now, this is some uh, data. There's there's numerous studies and, and we could be here all day talking about all of the studies that have been reported in the literature about the impact of COVID on our dialysis population. I just showed this particular slide um, uh, to, to, as an example of the high incidence rate of about 20% or so for patients who were on dialysis that had COVID. And also the transplant population also 20%, uh, and this is actually the risk of death. Um, and so this was a substantial uh, impact on, on, on death rates compared to patients if you can uh, see this bottom line on both of these graphs, this is the patients without um, COVID-19. So if you are a patient with COVID-19 or a transplant patient with COVID-19, you had almost a 20% higher risk of death compared to those who did not contract 
um, COVID. And this is looking at the home dialysis population and the diagnosis of COVID and then the mortality rate. And this particular um, study looked at both phases, so the beginning phase and then the later phase um, of, of the pandemic. You know, there was a good percentage of patients on home dialysis who did acquire um, COVID, um, but 4.5% and 6.4%. And then the important issue is the mortality rate is much lower than the than the general dialysis population of about 13%. Um, so definitely these patients were impacted, but at a much lower rate and improvement or reduction in death rates um, compared to their in-center counterparts. So what did we learn from COVID? Well, you know, we could be here all day again talking about lessons learned um, in all aspects of our society. Um, but certainly for the renal community, I mean, we all live through this. We know that it's difficult to socially distance in a typical in-center dialysis unit. There was a whole lot of efforts made, uh, protocols to have more, um, proper PPE and proper sanitation, et cetera, um, just heightened hygiene efforts in our dialysis units, um, development of isolation rooms, and even dialysis units that exclusively dialyzed COVID patients. So it was a lot that was done to help reduce the risk of exposure. But certainly we know that patients dialyzing at home were more able to limit their exposure compared to those um, in center. I think the biggest lesson learned from COVID, and I would say this is impacted our whole society and healthcare, was the use of telling medicine. And, and we'll talk a little more about that. That was a godsend, really. It's a way that we could still connect with our patients and, and particularly for the home patients who had to still come into the clinic uh, at least once or twice a month. Um, you know, the in-center patients, of course, didn't have a choice to come in. Um, and there was a lot of efforts to reduce the exposure to the staff, um, et cetera, people working remotely. For really, for the home patients, this was really an important measure so that these patients could stay connected because they weren't coming in um, to the centers as the in-center patients were. I just show some data um, um, from work that we did before and just looking at, um, and this was prior to the pandemic, that there was indeed racial disparities in home dialysis utilization. Um, as you can see for this slide, we have the percent on PD. Nationwide, I would say the utilization of PD is around 11 to 12 percent. Um, but we can see in this particular table that the African-American population was almost half of the white population. Better utilization in Asians and even better in um, Hispanics. Um, the African-Americans were the lowest. Um, all the racial groups were low in home hemodialysis um, utilization, um, but still the highest in the white population. Now, this data occurring, um, this was published again before the pandemic, but it compared the trends in home dialysis utilization according to race. Um, and the time periods uh, were from 2005 to 2013. And so the earlier part of this was up until about 2010 or 11, and then um, the patients after that up until 2013. And you can see that there were some, some improvements in utilization of home dialysis, 8% um, to 10%. Uh, in the uh, white population. And this was very encouraging. The African-American population, five to 8.3%, also increases in the Hispanic population and, and also in the Asian population. 
So even prior to the pandemic, we were seeing some improvements in, in utilization of home dialysis, but still, I think most of us would agree these are still overall low utilization rates and certainly something that would be very useful for our population at times such as the pandemic for us to have higher numbers on home dialysis. This is just showing um, just information about who chooses dialysis and is it really the patients or is it their uh, caregivers um, as far as our providers and uh, physicians, et cetera. Um, and just highlights the importance of patient education and choice. So this particular study that was published in 2016 um, just showed that if, if the patient had the choice and was given the choice, 95% of them would choose a home dialysis measure. In this particular case, it was peritoneal dialysis. Um, of those who were on in-center hemodialysis and were surveyed, they were told that 40, only 47% of those patients actually had a choice of choosing in-center. So that means 3% were basically told or directed towards in-center dialysis without any discussion or consideration for, for a home modality. And this is really in contrast to what providers, nephrologists, nurses would choose for themselves. Um, and so if they were asked about if they had to go on renal replacement therapy, what type of dialysis, and overwhelmingly over 90% would choose the home uh, regimen. And so really, I think the, the focus is for this change to where we're getting these higher numbers for patients who choose to start on home dialysis. We all know that there is such a more emphasis on patient priorities and perspectives, and certainly quality of life is one of the biggest ones and the biggest benefits for patients um, and considerations for what type of dialysis they perform. We know there's social issues, work issues, family being there for milestones, for children activities, et cetera, um, to feel better, to not feel so drained and tired after going to um, an in-center dialysis transplant. And so all of these things, in addition to being healthy and getting a transplant are all ideal goals uh, for our patients and should be taken into consideration by providers and healthcare personnel in order to direct patients to appropriate therapies. We all know that the quality of life in center is not great. Um, it can be inconvenient, inflexible schedule, time involved with travel. It's hard for patients to continue to work. Um, I mentioned the post dialysis fatigue. Um, the loss of sense of well-being and independence is a big one. Um, and certainly now we know um, as far as another reason for reduced quality of life on patients in center is that it is difficult to really maintain socially distance and to stay safe in pandemics that we'll have to contend with um, in, in the future. This was taken from a study that I was involved with, the Freedom Study, several years ago. This was patients on home hemodialysis. And so they reported all of these symptoms compared with how they were when they had in-center dialysis. And, and it was all markers of improved quality of life, less fatigue, less stress, less time for full recovery after treatment. And anyone here that has been on dialysis knows exactly what that means. Um, less headache, nausea, vomiting, less hypotensive episodes when you're doing a daily uh, hemodialysis regimen. Um, and there's also been data to show improved sleep scores and uh, sleep apnea, et cetera, and just improved quality of life scores.
This is, um, um, you know, all of you I'm, are familiar with with AKP and their patient advocacy and their um, just uh, robust clinical education uh, for patients. And so there's many of resources for all of you to refer to regarding understanding your dialysis options. And some of these things are listed um, in the pros and cons. Um, and this particular one is for peritoneal dialysis. There's gradual fluid removal instead of getting two or three liters or more per dialysis uh, treatment in center. For both home hemo and PD, you get definitely um, better blood pressure control because of the gradual fluid removal. You have better control of electrolytes, potassium, phosphorus. Um, you can travel. Um, that's you know one of the definite um, patient satisfaction areas where you're not restricted to um, going to a clinic three days a week. You can get on the road, go visit family, and take your equipment with you. Have uh, whatever other materials as far as bags of fluid mailed to you wherever you're going. Um, and the ability to maintain employment. Now, at the same time, there's there are some downsides to being on a home dialysis, and that's why it's so important to have proper education, um, good training with the nurses, because there are risks of infection um, due to peritoneal dialysis. Um, over time, the peritoneal membrane may not work as effectively, um, but you have to work with your healthcare team, your physician, in order to minimize these risks um, and identify them early on um, uh, before you get into any um, serious uh, problems. So for some patients who decide whether they do PD versus hemodialysis at home, these are just some of the areas or questions, considerations that will allow them to choose one or the other. And so that's how motivated they are, how much training time is needed uh, for both. It's usually longer for home hemodialysis compared to peritoneal dialysis. Some patients prefer to either have a not have an AV access in their arm, or they would not prefer to have a PD catheter in their abdomen. So these are all things that are discussed with the patient and what they feel like they um, could live with. The actual treatment schedule varies between home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Um, and peritoneal dialysis usually can be done um, it, it needs to be done on a daily basis, but can be done at night um, so that these patients can be free during the day. Some patients are afraid of needles and, and that's understandable. And so they would not want to choose a home hemodialysis. Now, perceived complexity, yes, hemodialysis is going to be more complex um, than peritoneal dialysis. Um, but you should not rule that out. Um, that's something that when you meet with your nurses and your physicians, um, it, it may seem harder than it really is. If you really take the time and you have a good nurse trainer, um, many patients can do well on home dialysis or especially hemodialysis. Other considerations are space, stable water supply, electricity, et cetera, um, to store the supplies. And for, especially for home hemodialysis, usually requires more of a helper or a caregiver at home to assist with the treatments. Um, but there are some patients who can do most of the treatment by themselves. And for peritoneal dialysis, usually they do not need um, a, a helper. There are so many benefits of home dialysis. Um, this is uh, home hemodialysis compared to in-center dialysis, but this also applies to peritoneal dialysis. There's better blood pressure control. There's electrolytes, potassium, uh, phosphorus, better volume control, and again, quality of life, one of the biggest things that the patients really um, want 
and can get with home dialysis therapies. Um, you know, certainly there are systematic barriers to having patients at home, uh, and, and it mostly centers around education. Um, if the patients don't know about their opportunities, they're not going to um, gravitate to home therapy. We know that physician education experience in home dialysis is also very crucial. Um, if they don't understand it well, they're not going to recommend it to a patient. So those are important issues. Um, and having dedicated and well-educated nurses to train patients is also very important. Safety concerns at home. Everyone is familiar with the American um, Kidney Health um, Initiative that I believe was 2019, um, pretty much right before the pandemic that was announced. And we all are who are advocates for home dialysis love having um, a focus and a desire to see more patients at home. Um, but we also need to make sure that these patients who are directed at home have adequate resources and that there's equitable um, opportunities uh, for patients to go home. We want to make that the patients are well educated and we want to also make sure they're supported with appropriate technology, easier to use technology, and access uh, to providers and nursing staff to help assist them with any problems that they may have. There's exciting things going on and um, with, with innovation and making dialysis safer. So this is really a good time in home dialysis um, the pandemic just really um, increased um, awareness about home dialysis and really the need for it um, as it is the best way to avoid um, exposure to other persons and in, in contracting COVID. So there's better educational tools and support. There's the development of telehealth and you not only just having access for the patients to see their doctors, but there's also exciting technology for remote patient monitoring. Um, there's some dialysis uh, technology using iPads, web-based um, interface where the dialysis nurses can actually see the patient's treatments um, and, and really intervene earlier um, before there's a major problem. And so this is great technology in order to um, enhance the safety of our patients. And then there's value-based care organizations that are partnering with insurance companies to provide comprehensive kidney care. And so this is just providing an additional resource for our patients to really survive at home. They have nurse navigators who come out to the home, um, make sure the patients are getting proper uh, medications and monitoring of their blood pressure, um, et cetera. So the, there is exciting um, things that are going on to help to make our patients more successful at home and feel more comfortable at home. And then this is just showing uh, with the telehealth. Um, many of you have probably been on some telehealth visits that under the CMS waiver, um, it allowed uh, patients and providers to connect via various platforms, including FaceTime, uh, Skype, um, and Zoom, and Doxis Doximity. So these were all approved platforms that allowed access um, to our patients. The telehealth visit and dialysis, this applies either for in-center and for home therapies. Um, I would say that most um, patients have been very um, satisfied with the care that they receive, as well as the providers and what they could conduct throughout the, uh, the exam via telehealth. You could still, um, of course, observe the patient um, evaluate them for any edema or signs of volume overload. You could look at their vascular access or their PD catheter 
um, very well and, and identify any abnormalities. Some patients or some uh, clinics, if the patient was in the clinic, may have had access to um, electronic stethoscopes, but that's not a requirement. Um, but that would certainly enhance the physical exam. We could review the patient's flow sheets, especially when they were electronic, but even on paper, I'd have the patients just show me their flow sheets that they recorded. I could look at their dialysis machine if they were on the machine during the exam and, you know, just look at everything, see if everything looks um, like it should and good blood pressures, good flows, make sure there wasn't any problem in arterial venous pressures if they were on hemodialysis. And then I think this is one of the great things. Most of us know that most of the dialysis units allowed um, the, the ancillary staff to work from home. So the dietitian, social workers um, could dial in via Zoom or whatever platform and connect with the patients through the, the multidisciplinary visits on a monthly basis. And this was really a great resource. And, and I would say our, our rounds were just as comprehensive as if they were um, in person. This is just showing the if your, um, your dialysis machine, um, your iPad, and other technologies that would help um, connect the patients to the clinic. We certainly know the benefit of telemedicine and it reduced exposure to, um, um, for the patients and the staff and maximize utilization of the provider workforce. And then again, the cyber rounds, um, multiple disciplinary. And then I think one of the highlights is involving the family because the family could be with the patient at home. And, and so because they, we weren't allowing family members to come into the dialysis unit uh, via telemedicine, we could con still connect with them. Again, the patients were very satisfied with telehealth. Um, they loved being able to be connected and still see their nurses and, and physicians. Um, they loved not being able to, to have to pay transportation costs, get in traffic, pay to park in some sense, instances, um, and just the improved patient satisfaction and quality of life. I actually think after the pandemic, I have a hard time <laughs> with patients coming back and to the center on a regular basis because they're so used to being at home. And um, I'm sure that most practices will continue home dialysis uh, telehealth visits um, to some degree um, in their practice going forward. The benefits is earlier diagnosis, treatment. Um, you could look at their exit site, see if there are signs of infection earlier than waiting for the patient to, to come in and they might not have transportation, et cetera. Um, there's definitely been data showing decreased clinic and ER visits, decreased hospitalization rate, and um, decreased cost of care, and obviously limited exposure to COVID. This is just a study that was actually published right before COVID. There's of other studies since COVID um, and showing the benefit of remote patient monitoring. And this is a group of PD patients. And on the right, this is just showing that with remote patient monitoring, there was a lower rate of prescription adjustments and preemptive consultations, and really almost a tripling of that when they had remote patient monitoring i.e. if the blood pressure was not well controlled and they, they, the nurses were looking at the, um, the, flow, the electronic flow sheets, they were able to intervene and get with the provider and make adjustments in their blood pressure medications. And, and this study also showed nicely a nice reduction in blood pressure in those who had um, exposure to re remote patient monitoring. So really the, the key points for success for home dialysis, um, well, we need to have dialysis providers who, who are um, strong advocates in promoting home dialysis and are comfortable with it. 
We need to make sure our training programs for young nephrologists include adequate exposure to home dialysis. Knowledgeable and dedicated nurses is key. New technologies for ease of use. And so many um, companies are working on new machines that are easier to use at home. And patients should ask their physicians regarding you know, what, what technologies are out there? What can I have access to to improve my chances of success at home? Patient education and engagement in your care, being proactive, not just following what was suggested, but you being involved in your patient care plan and, and what best suits you. Peer mentorship, I believe, is a useful tool to make patients more aware of home dialysis when they can talk to a fellow patient who's on home dialysis and share their experiences. Um, we certainly need to continue to leverage the use of telemedicine um, to increase the utilization of home dialysis. And we also need to make sure we ensure equitable access to telehealth. There are some concerns about not all patients, uh, especially in uh, uh, poverty-stricken um, areas, rural areas, may not have had adequate access um, to telehealth. So we need to make sure that there are policies in place um, to make sure that all patients have access. Um, use of remote patient monitoring is a key. So devices and technologies that allow this to happen is key for future um, utilization, increasing the use of home dialysis. Policy changes to support all of these um, key points, as well as um, there's lots of efforts and lobbies who are trying to get assistance for staff assistance for patients at home. So mechanisms in order to pay for that and to fund that um, for patients who may not have the adequate um, support and family support at home. And um, again, as far as uh, policy issues, continue to incentivize uh, value-based care organizations to provide home health services as a supplement to what the dialysis units are um, providing. So as I end, um, um, we, I, you know, the focus has been um, on patient uh, empowerment and engagement, making things easier for patients, making sure they have adequate access. And we know that patients who are engaged in their own care in general have better outcomes. And I always like to end with this quote, as Dorothy says in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home and we are all in this together. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this seminar and working with AAKP to educate all of you about home dialysis. And I'm happy to answer questions later in the discussion period. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Erin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. We will now hear from a few AAKP ambassadors who are on home dialysis therapies and why they chose their specific therapy. Our first speaker is Nihi Wikra Masinga, and hopefully I didn't butcher her name too badly. Mihi is 21 years old. She attends Chafee College and she lives with polycystic kidney disease. After first doing in-center hemodialysis, she decided to do peritoneal dialysis because she wanted a dialysis schedule that did not interfere with her daily life. She makes the most of her time on dialysis by doing schoolwork in the comfort of her home. Her hobbies include reading mystery books, watching movies, and swimming. As an AAKP ambassador, she hopes to help the kidney community to the best of her abilities. Mihi, I am so glad you have joined us today. I invite you to share with us about your home dialysis experience, including how you learned about home dialysis therapies and how you decided which one was right for you. 
I turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, you know, I do peritoneal dialysis. Currently, I was uh, hospitalized and discharged and put in a uh, hemodialysis uh, tubing. But as of right now, until we can get settled, um, I did do peritoneal dialysis. As a peritoneal dialysis patient, I do 10 hours every day. And it is much more in my schedule where I get to set up everything up, and it's also very um, accessible for me. I get to go to college. I get to do all the fun things I still can. And I get to spend time with my family because I'm at home. And I also, if I need help from my family, I still am able to get it. Um, I was told about peritoneal dialysis from a nephrologist, from my nephrologist. And it was suggested to me. And at first, I didn't think it was a good idea because I was told it was 10 hours every day. And I was very worried that I wouldn't be able to set everything up and I had to get training. But once all that was settled in, once I got the training and once I did the first day, I realized that it was best because my blood work was good and there was fluid that was being drained every single day, not every other day, where as if in hemodialysis. Where and in center hemodialysis you have surrounded by a lot of people. Um it's three hours, but it's not as accessible to you because you have to go I had to travel a long length. It would take me an hour and a half to get there. Um but in peritoneal dialysis, I'm doing it at night. I'm able to do my homework while I'm doing uh, peritoneal dialysis. So that's why I chose peritoneal dialysis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mihi. We appreciate you sharing your journey with kidney disease and dialysis. You're really an inspiration as a young person who has taken healthcare into your own hands, and, and we appreciate your time with us today. Our next speaker is Melissa Bensuda. At the age of 24, Melissa was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease after giving birth to her second daughter. After her third child, she had lost all functionality of her kidneys. She was placed on the transplant wait list in June of 2002. Although Melissa initially began dialysis treatments in center, she was selected to participate in a nocturnal home hemodialysis program. After six weeks of extensive training, Melissa set up a machine in her bedroom and dialyzed on her own every other night for eight hours while she slept. She received the gift of freedom from a deceased donor in April of 2012. Nearly five years post-transplant, Melissa's transplant kidney rejected, causing her to resume dialysis at home. Melissa is an AAKP ambassador and her passion and commitment to awareness has been revived following such an extensive journey. Despite working full-time and raising three children, Melissa is determined to continue advocating for technology, education, and research to improve outcomes of those affected by kidney disease. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us a little about your experiences on home dialysis. Hi, Erin, and hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm glad to be here this afternoon. Um, in terms, I, I think you summarized part of my journey very well. I started home hemodialysis um, about five months after I started dialysis in general. and. You know, my driving reason for that was because at the time I was 27, I had young kids, I wanted to have freedom. Um, I felt like the kidney disease diagnosis was not something that I wanted to have limit me in any capacity. And I didn't want my days, three days a week, to be consumed with travel back and forth to a clinic or having to lay in the cold dialysis center 
uh, for a few hours while waiting to get my blood clean. So I wanted to continue to work full time, um, raise my very young children at the time. And so that was really my driving factor. Fast forward now, um, 20 years next month, um, I'm still doing home dialysis. As you mentioned, nocturnal is my preference. Um, <clears throat> I haven't been on blood pressure medication in years. Uh, I haven't taken binders, phosphorus binders, pretty much ever, and generally have had um, a liberal diet, uh, which has sometimes gotten me into trouble because I've gained weight. But nonetheless, I um, am able to work full time and just continue to do the things that I enjoy doing with my family. Um, and so my kids, fast forward, now are, are adult age. And so it's not so much raising them that is important to me, but it's continuing to be there for them along their adult journeys and making sure that they're following a proper protocol um, and taking good care of their health and increasing awareness about kidney disease, which is something that they take to heart. Um, I prefer home hemodialysis nocturnal, uh, again, because I'm able to eat freely but then also it doesn't cut into my day. So by the time I start to set up my machine at night, it's usually time for me to go to bed anyway. And so I feel like I've had a productive day in somewhat of a normal um, life for a person with a chronic condition. Thank you, Melissa. It's so good to see you. It's been a long time. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much for... Uh for sharing your perspective and your personal experiences and, and why home dialysis works for you. We'll now bring back all of our speakers and address some questions that individuals sent in. Uh, some of these questions may have been addressed already during the presentation, but it would be great to, uh, to reiterate these points. Uh, so the first question here is, um, Probably for Dr. Lee, are you aware of the percentage of in-center hemodialysis patients that shifted to home dialysis during the pandemic? Yeah, there is um, not a lot of information about that, but I did um, um, see in a, in a couple of areas where, um, for example, Fresenius reported that they had a 25% increase in home dialysis in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, now, how much of that was changing from in-center to home hemo or just starting, I'm, I'm sorry, to home dialysis or just starting on home dialysis, I'm not clear. Um, but certainly there's higher numbers of patients on home dialysis um, compared to before the pandemic. And we also know that the American Health um, Kidney Health Initiative also um, started or was at least announced in 2019. And so some of that increase could have also been related to that. Thank you, Dr. Lee. This next question is um, for Mihi and Melissa, and we'll start with a, with a response from Mihi. This individual said they are interested in transitioning from in-center hemodialysis to a home therapy, but they're not sure how to start that conversation with their doctor. Uh, Mihi, can you provide any um, suggestions? And then we'll, we'll ask Melissa the same question. So first of all, ask as much as questions you want from the doctor. Ask them what type of um, home therapies they are, are because your doctor might provide you either home hemodialysis or home peritoneal dialysis based off of your body and based off of your health. That's what happened with me. Either one would situate. Um, ask as many questions and try to see how um, get help from anybody you can. Ask your family members if they are able to provide you uh, help if you would go into a home therapy situation because you would need some type of help from someone. Um, basically, just ask a lot of questions. That's uh, that's my answer because you're, you're, there's not little information that you can uh, get. There's a lot of information that you're going to get 
and at times it might seem a little bit stressful and a little bit too much um, information, but it's not. Trust me, it's going to be very useful. Thank you, Mihi. Melissa, what are your thoughts on how this, uh, this person can start that conversation with their doctor? So I think the you know just starting out the conversation with the question of you know what are the differences between in center and home dialysis in in terms of like functional differences so you know to be more specific what are the things that I as a patient can do to prepare myself for home dialysis if I'm a candidate um, so some of those things may be sticking your own needles um, in center. So that's kind of how I started out. I, from the moment my fistula developed, I think I was infiltrated like twice. And then I decided, yeah, I'm probably going to start sticking my own needles. And so I did from that point on. And so that's why one of the nurses approached me with um, the home dialysis program. But I, I think understanding what um, a, the patient involvement is, and then also what commitment they should expect from their healthcare team as they would approach this journey of home, um, home dialysis. So really just understanding roles and responsibilities. If I appear, you know, if I appear to be a sound candidate from a medical perspective, and then understanding what the commitment is more from a social and um, more practical uh, perspective at home. Thank you, Melissa and, and me. Those are great answers and uh, it really shows that you need to ask a lot of questions. Um, and I actually wanna bring Dr. Lee back in and see if she has any um, comments to add about how to start that conversation with the healthcare team. Yeah, well, I appreciate and echo the comments of our of our two uh, patients, and and you know they you just have to really just not be afraid. I think a lot of times patients are afraid or don't feel comfortable talking to the doctors. So you know, ask them, "Am I going to feel better? Am I going to live longer?" You know, all of these types of questions, and and really what what are the resources to help me if I have problems at home? You know, you want to make sure you have adequate access to the clinic staff um, and that the doctor is available, you know, when you have problems. Um, so those are all things that I, that I would, would focus on. Um, and, you know, how much time um, it takes to do the therapies. Um, we all know that the, the overall time is much less than having to travel back and forth to a center. Um, but, you know, you need to understand, is this something you have to do every day? Can you skip a day? You know, all those types of things need to, to be taken into account. Thank you. Uh, and kind of piggybacking off of that question, we had a, an individual write in and, and say that they are currently on um, in-center dialysis, but they're very interested in home dialysis. However, they don't have a lot of space at home and they don't have um, special water and electrical that's required. They also mentioned that their family is a little fearful about being their helper. How would this person um, overcome these challenges? Um, and I'll, I'll start with, uh, with Melissa for this question. So, I, you know, the first thing I kind of break that down a little bit <clears throat> in terms of spacing, I, the beautiful thing is there are more options for home dialysis therapies, either so ranging from the type of machine that you use, if you need an actual water system or not. And so I think this part speaks to the point about understanding the options that are available and making sure that there continue to be options available. Um, in terms of, you know, the family being concerned, you know, personally, I have done solo <laughs> dialysis for a number of years, well over almost, well over a decade. And so it is possible. Um, but I do think it's helpful to always include your family or care partner or team in those conversations with you so that some of the myths can be dispelled and each pe person can hear exactly what's involved 
and what the time commitment is and what the risk of you know, challenges could be. Thank you, Melissa. Mihi, do you have anything to add into that about um, this person's family maybe being a little afraid or unsure of, of what is involved in being a helper and um, an issue about the space? Um, I know with uh, peritoneal, there's a lot of um, a lot of supplies needed. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, as a person in the past who lived in an apartment, uh, there was there was not much space, but you know we made what was possible, um, and we had to put boxes in the living room, and people would who would come in would see all these boxes and would question it. Um, but the thing was, we would make what was possible, and to people who, you know, who are questioning, who has family members who are questioning and are concerned about helping out, well, you know what you can do is. Uh, sit them down and give them all the information, all the facts and all the pros and the cons and maybe tell them to ask the questions that they have for, from your doctors, from your nephrologist and any questions that they might have from you. Um, but mainly, you know, having that support is helpful. Maybe they're concerned that they have to do, be a bigger part than they think, but Tell them that, no, you know what? This is a team effort. Um, yes, it's gonna be at times difficult, but you will make with what you get. And I do remember at a time it was impossible. Um, not all my family members agreed with uh, the situation, but I had to sit them down and I had to sit my doctors down and let them talk to my doctors and let myself be silent. So whatever the questions they have, whatever the information they needed from the doctors that they can get it. And it, you know, there's like Melissa said, there is so many, um, so many technologies because there are different types of machines. I know as peritoneal dialysis patient, I've gone from one machine to another. One is smaller than the other. One is bigger than the other. And you can always have that discussion with your doctor and you can also have that discussion with your social worker and see what would benefit for you. Maybe going home or hemo, home hemodialysis is a little bit difficult with all those items. Maybe peritoneal dialysis is better or maybe going home hemodialysis is better than peritoneal dialysis. But um, as Melissa said, there's, there's different types of machines so that is uh, more accessible for your household. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Mihi. I appreciate how you, you both, um, you know, suggested uh, including your family and your caregivers uh, as part of that discussion with your healthcare team. I think that's um, really key. Um, and I invite uh, Dr. Lee to, to share any uh, additional thoughts that she may have uh, about that. Yes, I, I would, would just add that the patients and their caregivers go to the home unit, meet with the nurses, and actually look at the machines, go over how the procedure is done so that you get a visualization of what is required. I think sometimes um, the patients just see how complicated hemodialysis looks in the center. And they'd say, oh, I could never do this at home. But if they really sit down um, with the staff and, and actually go over it and talk about the time for training and how they'll make them, they won't have them go home until they're ready. Um, so I, I, they may change their mind after they do that. Um, for people who are trying to decide about home hemodialysis, I usually tell them that the hardest thing is cannulating themselves. And if they could learn that while they're in center, um, then it'll make everything much easier once they get home. So that's one potential strategy um, uh, to make them more comfortable um, at home. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And cannulating is um, what Melissa had mentioned, was sticking yourself with a needle 
and how she started doing that uh, herself in center, uh, which kind of helps with the transition to doing dialysis at home. Uh, and one final question, and this is um, for Dr. Lee. Um, are there any, um, what are the latest innovations uh, regarding home-based dialysis? Uh, and is smart technology being utilized um, in any of these treatments? Yeah, as I as I alluded to, there's de there's definitely um, some exciting technology. Um, you know, there's um, easier to use home hemodialysis machines that are on the market or being developed. Um, there's online water generation for for dialysis at home, for, both for hemo and for PD, um, to which will make the space limitations um, much uh, less um, because you're not having to store all these bags of fluid. Um, there'll be online generation of water. Um, and then, of course, the, the technology to record all of the treatments um, on the web so that the dialysis units have access to that um, and can, you know, intervene if they see that there's problems. So, yes, there's a, a lot of exciting things that are, that are coming to make, make this easier for patients at home. That's great to hear. So thank you all again so much. Um, I invite you to, to say a few words in closing if you'd like. Um, Mihi, we can start with you. Um, I just wanna say that if you do choose, um, whether it's home hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, uh, know that you're gonna get the support and resources that you need. Um, you could also ask it around your community for help as well, for whether it's for uh, getting your supplies inside or having, when you know, some people were talking about water, um, trying to see if there's a situation for your machine. Uh, but overall, I would choose home uh, therapies over in center any day. And just know that you're gonna get the support that you need you just have to ask. Thank you. Closing words for us. Oh, sorry. Was that for me, Erin? Oh, yes. <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. Um, that's okay. No, I I um, share the same sentiments. One, thank you again for having me. I think the other thing is, you know, it's been almost 20 years strong for me since originally starting dialysis. I don't know that I would have made it without home dialysis, the flexibility, the longer treatments, the less intense treatments. Um, even if it's something that doesn't turn out to work um, for other patients, I definitely encourage people to ask the question, to reach out, to learn more about it. Um, and then to speak with those, the other thing I meant to mention earlier was, just if you have an opportunity to speak with someone who is on a home modality, um, connecting with them to hear the, the real life version of how things are going for them. Um, that's all I had to add. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, Melissa. That, that's a, a great point. And if anybody watching has questions, um, please reach out to, to AAKP and, and we can connect you with somebody who can share you know, like Melissa said, the real life uh, version of, of what it's like being on home dialysis. And Dr. Lee, do you have any closing thoughts for us? Uh, sure, again, um, thanks. I'm excited to be a part of this seminar and I just want everybody to remember what I said, there's no place like home. Um, and, and that includes uh, home dialysis and to really, you know, uh, an educated patient is the best patient and has the better outcomes. So go and ask questions, don't be afraid um, and talk to your providers, your nurses um, and, and find out everything you need to know. Use the resources through AAKP and with our patient ambassadors um, and having mentors 
that have been through this, I mean, all of these resources will help you be successful at home. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Thank you all so much. Uh, we'll now close with a, a few uh, slides that we have with additional materials and resources from AAKP. AAKP is dedicated to, um, oh, excuse me, uh, if you are not already a patient, uh, a member of AAKP, we encourage you to join us. We offer free membership to patients and family members, as well as living kidney donors. To become a free member, please join us online at aakp.org or by phone. And to receive all the benefits of membership, please be sure to include your email address when signing up. As an AAKP member, you will be notified by email when opportunities arise where your opinions and experiences are needed to help inform innovation, advance care, and make a meaningful impact to improve lives. We encourage you to respond to our flash surveys and other engagement opportunities to help us elevate the patient voice and change the status quo for kidney disease care. You can also select to receive any of our five different electronic newsletters and subscribe to our print magazine, AAKP Renal Life. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients and caregivers, including our coping, living, and thriving with kidney disease brochure. By visiting our website at aakp.org and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order or download. You can also order materials by phone. We are pleased to share that our 2022 events will take place virtually and with free registration to ensure all can participate. Our Global Innovation Summit with George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences will take place June 29th and 30th. Our national patient meeting will be September 21st through the 23rd, and our policy summit is scheduled for November 16th. We also encourage you to visit our on-demand webpage where you can find educational sessions from our previous events. We continue to keep our coronavirus resource page updated and you can find recordings of previous COVID webinars here. The page can be accessed from the big red button on our aakp.org homepage. We'd again like to thank today's speakers, Dr. Janice Lee, Mihi, and Melissa for their time today. And thank you to Baxter for supporting this webinar. We hope you all will continue to be informed and stay safe. Thank you.